Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Welcome any guests. We are grateful to have you with us. Well, we're going to continue in our study through Romans this morning. If you'll turn to chapter 4, we're going to look at this beautiful section on circumcision. Not a lot of books out there written on it, and there hasn't been any conferences in the last 10 years on circumcision. And my prayer by the end of the morning, it could be one of your favorite passages of Scripture. It's just uh, rich. And so what I would like to do is go to God and ask Him to meet us in power, as we learned last week, to lift burdens and give joy and make you strong in your faith. So let's go to our God. Father, I thank You for the beauty of this day. Lord, it feels so good to be outside and, and we've asked You to clear the smoke and it's, boy, it's the best it's been in weeks. And we just want to thank You for just mercies like that. I pray that um, now as we open the Word of God, that we would worship You through it. God, these are the, the words of the living God. Let our hearts just praise You and listen and be attentive and let us understand it, have affection for You and desires to obey You. And so God, I thank You for Paul and the book of Romans and Your Holy Spirit inspiring every jot and tittle of it. And so, Lord, now have your way. Do it. Let your Spirit illuminate these words now to every mind and heart. And let us be worshipers of the living God this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, before unfolding this passage, I just want to give you a little history of Israel on circumcision so we can understand what Paul is getting at in these verses before us. Because circumcision, it's not something we think about a lot, or in our day and age where we argue about it or fight over it or even stumble over it. And so the question before us then is Abraham's blessing in chapter 4, verse 3, that he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. The, the gospel, he, he believes what God said and God put righteousness to his account and now he's right with God. And so the, the question being asked is, does that blessing then come upon those who are circumcised or uncircumcised. That was the argument of their day. Why such a question? If that won't even come to our minds, let's understand it because it'll apply very much to our day and age. And so let's walk through the history of redemption with Abraham and circumcision. And I just want to focus on the aspect that will tie into Romans 4. So if you will turn to Genesis chapter 17... I want to set our context by reading when God gave circumcision to Abraham and the nation of Israel. <clears throat> Verse 1. Now when Abram, he's 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will establish my covenant between me and you. And I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations, 99-year-old Abraham. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. And I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who is brought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. 
And thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people, for he's broken my covenant. And so went the history of Israel after this was given. They were circumcised by the the blessing of Abraham that brought them into the family of God. They were God's covenant people. And all males were circumcised on the eighth day. And if not, you were unclean and you were outside of the people of God, cut off. The way they distinguished between them and other people is they'd say, we are the circumcised and you are the uncircumcised. In the days of Jesus and Paul writing this, the uncircumcised were considered unclean and Gentile pagans. They were considered enemies and outside the promise of covenant. Remember when David came after Goliath and he said, you uncircumcised Philistine. So as many things degraded in the Old Testament to just the externals without the heart, and so it does today, the Jews began to believe that circumcision was necessary for salvation. That's what brought salvation. And so if a Gentile wanted to be brought into the people of God, he he had to be circumcised and come under the Mosaic law, and he's still kind of a second-class citizen, but he would be called in the covenant people. In the book of Jubilees, this will help you get a feel for when Paul was writing this, what they were thinking. They said this law is for all generations forever, and there is no circumcision of the time, and no passing over one day out of the eight days, For it's an eternal ordinance, ordained and written in the heavenly tables, and everyone that is born, the flesh of whose foreskin is not circumcised on the eighth day, belongs not to the children of the covenant which the Lord made with Abraham. For he belongs to the children of destruction, nor is there moreover any sign on him that he is the Lord's, but to be destroyed and slain from the earth." And so they would, they would be cast into hell if they were not circumcised. They're rejected and they're outside. So now when the apostles and believers begin to preach the gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation. First to the Jew and to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And as that gospel is now being proclaimed to all people who believe you're going to be saved and made righteous, they say, what did Abraham find? Well, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And it was done apart from works, apart from circumcision, and apart from anything Abraham did but believe. And they, they, they're undone now at the preaching of this gospel. They're calling Paul a heretic and anyone who preached this for their whole history. Because circumcision is the way to get into the people of God. And now you're preaching it's by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so the way into the promise made to Abraham, to this inheritance, to this blessing, was by faith. And it became quite a problem in the early church as the new covenant began to spread and the gospel started going out. The Judaizers were coming into the church saying, no, no, it's Jesus Christ plus circumcision. you got to get into the people of God. And he gave us circumcision. That's how you get in. So it's Jesus plus circumcision and some of the ceremonial and moral aspects of the Mosaic law that you must keep. The whole book of Galatians was written over this heresy that was spreading through the church. And so in Acts 15, they had to call an assembly with all the apostles to say, what do we do with this idea of you got to be circumcised, adding it to getting in to rightness with God through circumcision? And turn to Acts 15. Acts 15. I can't hear the Bibles turning up here. Are you going? Acts 15. Oh, now I hear them. Verse 1, and some men came down from Judea, and they began teaching the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, here you are, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders to, to hear this issue out. 
and therefore being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. And they were bringing great joy to all the brethren the way God was moving and saving Gentiles. And when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But certain ones of the sects of the Pharisee who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders came together and they looked into this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said, brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, and he gave them the Holy Spirit just as he gave them to us. And he made no distinction between us and the Gentiles, cleansing their hearts by faith, the circumcision of the heart by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have ever been able to bear. No one's ever been able to keep the law. Why are you going to put them back under it again? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. The whole thing we've been studying in Romans. And all the multitude kept silent. And they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after these things I will return. And I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, in order that the rest of mankind, the Gentiles, may seek the Lord, and that all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles with being circumcised and keeping the Mosaic Law. And so this was very big in redemptive history. You don't have to become a Jew to be saved and to become the people of God. All you have to do is believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You can be in the covenant people of God now, the church, by faith and not by circumcision and keeping ceremonial law. There's a new way to become the people of God. And it's by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So now let's move into Paul's argument, what he's declaring about the gospel and what Abraham found, and it's just beautiful. And so Paul says, hey, let's do a Bible study. Last week, I love what he said, for what does the scripture say? You know, Abraham did works to get right. What did the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And now this morning, he's going to come again and say, let's do a little Bible study. And so I'm going to give you your outline this morning. Paul is going to declare that justification did not come by circumcision in verses 9 through 12. And there's just three parts to our outline. He asks a question, he gives an answer, and then he's going to make application. It's very simple. So look with me in verse 9 at the question. <clears throat> is this blessing then on the circumcised or the uncircumcised also, for we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. The question, circumcision, was the only way that a Jew ever thought about who could get the blessing of Abraham. And Paul is now asking a question that most of them probably have never even asked. And they, they had thought about verse 9, but they thought this way, who gets the blessing? Who gets Abraham's blessing? Well, it's those who are circumcised and are descendants of Abraham. That's who's going to get the blessing. And they, they'd never struggled with that. They believed that. But the answer that Paul's about to give should take your breath away, just like it did last week. It, it just The Jews should have just been silent. That Abraham saved by works. What does it say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. End of argument. End of discussion. Well, let's look at the answer this morning in the same way 
and verse 10. How then was it credited to Abraham? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Have you ever had those times when you're arguing for something and all of a sudden it just gets so clear and you realize I'm wrong from Scripture? And you're just silent. I remember in seminary, I, I heard the doctrine of election. I'm like, no way. I'm studying and I'm looking at all these verses and all of a sudden it's a page of the Bible and I'm like, oh no, this is in God's word. This is true. And then all of a sudden it's just argument over. The whole Bible talks about it. We're his called ones, we're his chosen ones. This argument is just like that. It's so clear and plain. It's just done. Verse 10, just here's the answer. Last week we looked at Genesis 15. God believed. Abraham believed God and it was credited as righteousness. This week, Abraham believed God and it was credited to righteousness and he's justified. But the argument is just simple. Which comes first? Genesis 15 or Genesis 17? Genesis 15, Abraham saved. He believes and he's justified. And now Genesis 17, we're going to see, comes 14 years later. Just end of argument. 14 years later, he's already saved. He's justified. And now 14 years later, here's circumcision. So how did Abraham get saved when, when he was uncircumcised or circumcised? Paul's argument. 14 years later, Genesis 17 comes. God comes to Abraham and he gives him circumcision as I read this morning. The sign of the covenant that God made with him to bless him and all the nations from a singular seed that would come later named Jesus Christ and all the nations would be blessed from him that believe. <clears throat> so 14 years, Abraham was saved, justified as an uncircumcised man. He was right with God for 14 years before it. And you say, I never noticed that before. What's well, right there in my Bible and recorded history of God's story, and you think the argument would just stop right there. So pray tell. Circumcision cannot be the entryway into God's favor and acceptance and into justification. It can't be. Just look at history. That isn't how it works. So get this, if Abraham was right with God before circumcision, circumcision cannot be added to the foundation of rightness with God. You can't do what the Jews were doing. You need circumcision to get right with God. You can't add it because he was already right with God 14 years before circumcision came. That's Paul's argument. And that was the argument going on in Galatians. And I just want to read that to you in Galatians 5. Paul says it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And that's what they were doing. You got to add, you got to keep Moses. You got to do these ceremonial things. You got to be circumcised. They're adding to salvation in Jesus Christ alone. And it's a yoke of slavery to go back under the law to get right with God. So behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision for this reason, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Jesus plus anything, you, you destroy the whole gospel. He'll be no benefit to you if you add anything to Christ to get right with God. And I testify again, Paul said, to every man who receives circumcision. If you do, you are under obligation then to keep the whole law. You want parts of it? You can't. If you go into the law, you better fulfill the whole thing perfectly, which they already said in Acts 15, none of us were ever able to do. You've been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love, which is where we're going to journey in Romans as this faith is going to produce a life like no other, a life that loves God and loves others. So there's your question. And was he circumcised or uncircumcised when, when he was justified? And the answer is he was, he was justified 14 years before he was circumcised. And so now Paul says, let's make application. 
Look with me in verse 11. The application is, why then was Abraham circumcised? Why make circumcision a law binding on all of Abraham's descendants? What was it all about? Did it have any value? Does it have any value today? And I want you to see what it is in verse 11. (coughs) And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be what? The father of all who believe without being circumcised. That righteousness might be credited to them. And so the sign is, is circumcision was a sign of what Abraham received 14 years previous. And so a sign is a, a visible object that points to something greater than itself. If you're driving and there's a sign that says, Denver, 175 miles ahead, what do you know? You, you know that the sign is not Denver. The sign is pointing to Denver. And though it's, it's less than the city, it's not without value. There's value in that sign telling you Denver's ahead. Maybe a better example would be an, an engagement ring that you give to your fiance. I'll never forget that. I remember when I bought mine for Laura, I got it out every night because she was in California and I was in Colorado. That's not wise. <laughs> but I, I'm looking at it every day just like, man, I hope I picked the right one. I hope she's going to like it. And I, I just remember flying out to California for spring break and staying with, uh, with a friend of hers, this guy in a dorm room. And so I, I went out to see her. And so what I did is I, I put that ring in the dirtiest pair of underwear that I had so no one would steal it from the dorm room. Now that's wisdom. And I, the, and I never keep secrets. So Laura thought, oh, he's not going to propose and then that last night, we're, we're walking and the sun's setting on the, on the ocean. I'm killing you guys, I know it. And I proposed. And then about six months later, we stood on an altar and these rings had two pieces to it. And so on the altar, you gave the other piece. And, and so the question is, if that ring was everything, I would miss it. That ring was a sign of the covenant that I made before God to love her until death do us part. And if all it was was about the ring and how shiny it was, how much it cost, if the diamond was nice and all that, you, you miss it. Because it's a sign of a covenant that reminds you of the covenant that you made with your wife before God. And so the ring isn't the, the covenant. The ring is the sign of the covenant. So circumcision was the sign pointing to the covenant that God established with Abraham based upon God's work, based upon his doing, based upon his blessing. He would, he would do everything necessary in the covenant to bring Abraham and us into the people of God. And so the Jews had turned circumcision into the wedding ceremony. They turned it into the vows, into the marriage license that brought you into a relationship with God. Not as a ring. It, it, not as a sign of the transaction that Abraham believed and was declared righteous and circumcision was a sign of what God did with Abraham when he believed. And so this was a big swing and a miss what Israel did with circumcision. And secondly, it's a seal which meant to confirm, attest, or authenticate. John six twenty seven. Jesus said, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you. For on Him, the Father, even God, has set His seal. And the seal is referenced to His baptism when He said, this is My beloved Son in who I am well pleased. It, it was a seal. Circumcision was given to Abraham to give the authentication and the certainty that righteousness had indeed been imputed to your account by faith. And so the circumcision did not convey the righteousness, but it gave outward confirmation of the righteousness that God gave to Abraham by faith. So look at verse 11. (laughs) Abraham then received the sign, a seal 
of his faith. And so it was the faith that he had while he was uncircumcised. In verse 11, it says, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. Abraham is our father, believing Gentiles. Gentiles who believe in the promise of God that we've been learning in Romans of a son who was put up on a tree and propitiated the wrath of God in our place. Of a son who came and perfectly obeyed the law in our place. And when we believe in that, it is given to us. And when we believe that, we are brought into the people of God. And so Father Abraham, as little kids, I don't know if you still sing it, Father Abraham had many sons, had many sons, had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, so let's just praise the Lord, amen? It's the faith of Abraham that brings us into the promise and the blessing and the justification of being right with your God here this morning. That righteousness, it says, might be credited to us as we believe that will be put to our account. And then in verse 12, the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, so the Jews, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. And so to those who who were circumcised and of Abraham, so what he says here is, is the Jews, a true Jew is not just being Jewish, but it's having the faith of Abraham and he's going to flush that out in Romans 9 through 11 that that not all Israel is Israel. And it's the it doesn't matter if you're a descendant of Abraham if you don't have his faith you're not of the family of God. So it's not just being circumcised on the externals. And so it's those who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham which he had when he was uncircumcised. And so Paul, just laying it out there for the Gentile who has the faith of Abraham, your heart is circumcised and you're saved and brought into the people of God. And the Jews, if you just are resting in circumcision, that will do nothing. It's the faith that believes what Abraham believed when he was uncircumcised and brought him in to a right standing with God. Summary. Circumcision then was not a way of getting right with God. It was not the way to become the children of God. It was never given as the foundation of justification. It was a sign and a seal of what was received by faith when Abraham believed God and was justified. And so favor with God brought him into a covenantal relationship with God. And that is the same for us this day. How did Paul know this? He read his Bible. (laughs) It wasn't made up. It's not special revelation. It's just right there in the Bible. Genesis 15 comes before Genesis 17. And in circumcision then is a sign and a seal. And God always gives a sign. So many times He gives Noah a rainbow. Children of Abraham, circumcision. He gives us baptism. The Lord's Supper. I was thinking through that. Come back to the wedding again. What if you had no rings? What, would you be properly married if you didn't have rings? Who was it I forgot the rings at the ceremony? Are they here? I was running through my head and I could not remember it. Oh, it's you. <laughs> hey, Todd, I love you, brother. I, I pronounced them, they kissed, and they're walking down the aisle and Laura's pointing to her ring and I'm like, what is she talking about? And I had to call them all the way back, bring them back up on the altar and have them exchange their rings. But if I wouldn't have caught that, Todd and Jackie would have still been married. We would have just gave them rings later. So I just want you to see, um, (coughs) you can be married without rings. Does a ring make your marriage more legal? Does it make it more lasting? No. It's a sign and a seal for the couple of the vow that you made before God that I'm going to love you until death do us part. And so there it is. it, It doesn't make you married. It's just a sign that you are. And so circumcision is a sign for every Jewish male for the seal of the righteousness that God gave to Abraham when he believed. It just kept passing on the covenant. Why were the covenant people of God? Abraham believed and it was reckoned to him. That's what circumcision was to tell you 
all of those years not to get you justified, but to remind you of how Abraham got you into the blessing of God. He believed. It was to mean the same thing that it meant to Abraham. And so I pray that we would realize that the sacraments then of God's covenants are signs and seals of God's grace. And so get this, the sign did not point to Abraham, but to Abraham's God who justified those who believe what he says and come into relationship. That's what it was pointing to. And now under the new covenant, there's a type. That was all a type. And now it's the circumcision of the heart that brings you in to the covenant people of God. It's a a new heart that God will take the stony one and give you one of flesh that brings you into covenant relationship with God and His people. A circumcised heart is the one who has the faith of Abraham in the seed, Jesus Christ. And so my circumcised heart is a sign that I am justified by God's grace in believing. And so this new heart preaches and proclaims to me that it's been circumcised because I love the law of God. I delight in His righteousness and to be pleasing to Him. The obedience of faith that we talked about at the beginning of this letter. So though I do not see Christ, I love Him. And the sign of the covenant that God has made with me, I got this new heart. What a gift from God. That's a question maybe to ask this morning. Is the sign of the new covenant that you were circumcised as a baby? Or is it that you sit here this morning with a new heart that believes this gospel and loves God and loves others? That's the sign of the covenant. You can do all the external things just like the Jews were doing. Go to church, get baptized, you'll just be wet. There's all these things that you can do that will mean nothing if you don't have a circumcised heart. The sign of the rainbow that God gave to Noah was not a sign of Noah's faith. It was a sign that God would keep His promise and not flood the earth again. Circumcision was a promise that God would provide righteousness to all who believe what He says. The Lord's Supper is a sign of what the seed did so that we could get the blessing of righteousness. It's a reminder of His shed blood and His body uh, broken on a cross in our place. And that's how I can get right with God. It's a constant reminder. Do this in remembrance of me. Baptism is a sign of what Christ has done for you. You're buried. What you were in Adam died. And what has come forth is this new circumcised heart that loves Christ. The gospel is to look at Christ, to fix our eyes on Him. Faith looks to Christ. And all of these signs are not to look at us. All of these signs are gifts to look at Him, to stare at Him and rejoice and believe. And those are the ones who are justified by our God. So to make some application as we close out this morning. First one is where we've been told in verses 1-6, through six, we're saved not by our good works. We're not working ones trying to get ourselves right with God. And then now we're not saved by ordinances and sacraments. And many in our days look to these things. There's churches that believe if you're baptized in water that that's how you're born again. There are churches that believe when you take communion, that's how you're saved by taking the literal body of Jesus into yourself. They've done the exact same thing that the Jews were doing with circumcision. And so this is so powerful to my own heart. And I want you to hear this. <clears throat> there was nothing that Abraham did after he believed that was placed in the foundation by which he was justified. So hear this. There was nothing that Abraham did after he believed that was placed into the foundation when God justified him. So I want you to hear it. When he offered up Isaac, was faithful and beautiful. But that is not what was put into his foundation of justification. That was his obedience to God. And it wasn't circumcision that came 14 years later that can't go into the foundation 
of how he got right with God. How did he get right with God? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. There's nothing else you can add into that foundation. And anything you add to it, you break the foundation, it sinks. You can have Jesus in that foundation, and if you add something into it, you will ruin the whole foundation. Christ alone, cornerstone, he's your foundation. The great Puritan John Owen said one of the most important things in the world for a Christian believer is not to try to build into the grounds of his or her acceptance with God. Anything that the believer does after they have become Christians, don't try to bring that into the foundation of how you get right with God. Some of you sit here week after week trying to bring your own obedience and Bible reading into the foundation and it breaks it. There's only one foundation for you to ever stand before God justified, right, and accepted. And it's by believing what God said He has done and the work of His Son and raising Him from the dead saying it's finished. And all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Anything we do today or in the future cannot build into that foundation. I'm begging you to throw that down if that's still your thinking. So hear this. Our acceptance with God is not based on anything in us or coming out of us. We are not less acceptable by what we did this week. You cannot add to your justification. You cannot become more justified or less justified. Only the righteousness of Jesus Christ can justify us and we can add nothing to it. And that's the best news I've ever heard. And the free gift of God is a full righteousness in Jesus Christ. So do not call your works getting right with God. Call it a sign. Call it authentication. Call it fruit. Call it obedience of faith. But don't call it foundation. Please, do not call it the instrument of getting right with God. Don't ever call it justification or you'll be in bondage the rest of your life to trying to be good enough to make God love you the hardest battle I've ever faced is to stand in the truth that I am justified by the mercy of God alone. And most of us try to add to the foundation to make us feel more secure than just the bare work of Jesus Christ alone. And the enemy's been working and doing that in hearts for thousands and thousands of years. And we're going to close out about just one thing I want to remind you. Some of you are getting a little anxious you're like, man, all that guy preaches is the freeness of Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll say that till I die. But Paul's going to move to Romans 6 and he's going to say, should we just sin then that grace might abound? Pastor, you're making this thing so free. and There's nothing I bring. It's only to Christ I cling. It's all his doing. And Paul just keeps weaving it from every angle. Why do you think he keeps doing that? Because we're so prone to put something back in our foundation by what we do. And we all just keep doing it again and again. And so he's wanting us to come there. And, and, and then we're going to see that what this will produce is better works than you'll ever get by law. You're going to begin to see a righteousness that will be so beautiful. But if you do not get this and you progress to sanctification, you'll shipwreck your life. I know some of you are doing it. I counsel it. You're, you're, you're trying to, to do the things so that you can feel justified. And if you don't settle this, why, that's why Paul's just fighting you and I'm fighting you. You've got to settle this because this is the foundation for all righteousness. You get his righteousness to be right and that foundation is where righteousness will flow from being brought into union with Jesus Christ. So I'm just reminding you because some of you are just saying, that guy doesn't believe in obedience. That's just a big lie. Obedience of faith. But faith in this. And I pray that you're getting it. Okay, one more application. This is why we're Baptists, okay? It's not Southside Baptist Church, but this is why we believe in baptizing those who have faith in Jesus Christ. We believe the Scriptures teach clearly that baptism is after you have the faith of Abraham in Jesus Christ. You know why? It's a sign. It's a sign of what has already taken place in your heart. You've already been made right with God, and baptism is this ring. It's a picture 
of dying in Adam and being raised a new creation, cleansed and forgiven and right with God. Baptism, I, I can't over emphasize enough how important it is to have this sign. And so my Presbyterian brothers and sisters, and some of you sit here in this church and we love you. We don't divide over this issue. But they take this text and they take eight-day-old male babies. They were circumcised and they were brought into the covenant of the people of God with Israel. And now we're under the new covenant. So we don't circumcise them to bring them in. We baptize them. So we, we baptize our children not to save them. If they said it was to save them, we would break fellowship. But they don't say that. They believe in justification by faith in Christ alone. But they believe by baptizing them, it brings them in to the covenant people of God and it gives them kind of special blessing that, that now they're around the means and, and they do still have to come to faith. So they, they get that. And I, I like that. But what does the text say? Abraham received the sign after faith. The sign attests to the faith of Abraham. And so the prerequisite to baptism is faith in Christ alone, that you believe God. And it's credited to you as righteousness. That's the prerequisite to the sign. And then secondly, Paul in this text is minimizing the importance of physical descent. He's, he's talking about faith. And so this principle does not continue in the new covenant. You can't find it anywhere. Get baptized and become a covenant member of the people of God. And so at Southside, what we do to become members is we hear your testimony do you have the faith of Abraham? Do you believe this gospel? And so everyone who becomes a member here, the best we can tell is that you have the faith of Abraham and you've been justified. And then have you been baptized after faith? If you were sprinkled as an infant, that's not baptism. Baptism is I've come to the faith of Abraham and now I get in the waters to make public that I'm declaring I'm, I'm, I'm in the people of God. Because I have faith, and I died, and I've been raised to walk in newness of life. And we dedicate babies. We dedicate parents to the Lord and us as a church to give everything we have to help these little ones be led to the faith of Abraham. And so we dedicate them for that. And so if you have not obeyed the Lord and this ordinance to be baptized, to show forth your faith and salvation and your heart to follow Jesus, that you have a circumcised heart, on September 20th, we're going to be doing a night of baptisms, and, and we're shooting for a pie fellowship, which makes everything just a little bit better. And so I want to encourage you to follow after Jesus Christ. He commanded it in the Great Commission. And so baptism isn't something that, it's, it's an important thing of following it in the footsteps of Jesus and going public that I believe this and, and, and the sign and what it does for all of us in, in the gospel to, to see more of Christ and his salvation. And so I encourage you to reach out to one of the elders. And then maybe one last thought. No matter what your sins are here this morning, please hear this. No matter what your sins are here this morning, and no matter what your heritage if my salvation hung on my family tree, I'd be toast. I don't care if you're, what your heritage is and your family tree, your education, your abilities, your job, your appearance. Abraham believed God and he was righteous. He was made righteous and brought into the family of God. And when you do this, you're not a second class citizen in the church and you don't have lower privilege. It's a lie to say, I just don't belong here. Full membership, full privileges, full acceptance. It doesn't matter who your daddy is. It matters that you got the faith of Father Abraham. And I want you to be set free if you sit here with just a long heritage of crime and brokenness and atheism and worshiping Satan and all these things. I want you to realize that does not get in the way of being made right with God. I want you to be free of your past and your heritage as we saw here with Father Abraham. And maybe one last thought to the last thought. This message 
opens the door to salvation to all the peoples of the world. Abraham does not prove that uncircumcision cannot be justified, right? Just the opposite of what the Jews were were thinking. He was a heathen called out and saved while he was uncircumcised. And so circumcision or uncircumcision does not shut the door to the Gentiles. It blows it wide open. And so natural descent cannot save you. Being a part of a denomination cannot save you. And I want you to hear this. Baptism cannot save you. The sacraments cannot save you. Being religious cannot save you. Abraham's faith in what God said saved him. And he is now the father of all who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's by faith. And our message is perfect to take to the nations because it's not come to Israel anymore and become a Jew and enter into their ceremonial and temple worship. It's now fitted for every people group. Whether you are black, white, yellow, Ethiopian, Kiwi, American or Chinese, a corporate executive or a, or a, or a, a neighbor. It's no longer Judaism, it's by faith. And the one thing that gets you right with God. And faith is the most accessible act of the human heart in the universe. There's nothing easier than faith. Anyone can do it. You don't need legs. You don't need arms. You don't need smarts. You don't need to be distinguished. You rest on Jesus and you fall on Him and you depend on Him for His alien righteousness. And you will be declared righteous. And so I pray that we would go take this into our world the places we live and into our neighborhoods and and do as much as we can to get it to the world. Because what a glorious new covenant. All who will believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that there's nothing else in our foundation but the work of Jesus Christ. And I thank you that it's finished. And I thank you that you're satisfied. You raised him and you declared it was sufficient. And now any who will fall on that, any who will believe upon His work of dying on a cross in our place and living the life that we should have, that now we can be justified before our God. We can be loved and accepted. We can be brought into union with Christ. We can dwell in Your presence safely. God, I thank You for such a gospel. Don't let us put anything else in that foundation. Let us fight the devil, the world, and our own flesh put something else on that foundation. And so if there are any sitting here who have begun putting things like how well I did this week in my foundation for acceptance with God, Lord, would you let them throw it down in repentance even right now in the openness before their God outside. God, I pray. I pray that you will move in power in our lives now in freeness. Let us stay in the freedom of the gospel. And go and proclaim the best message there ever has been. God, let us not hide it and keep it to ourselves. Let us find ways to declare the glories and the beauties and the salvation that is to be found in Christ Jesus. God, let goods and kindred go this mortal life also. I pray that we would lose all for the one who lost it all for us on a tree. God, thank you for the beauties and the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. And all God's people said. And all God's people said. Hey, thank you. For Baptists, remember?